In the back instead of in the hospital. So we've got Maddie back in the back. Yay. <laughs> there was much rejoicing. Okay, uh, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> we'll pick up where we left off. My wife's telling me my hair's all over the place, which means I look sort of funky, and she don't want me to look funky. But that's a little too late for that. <laughs> Since I was born, <laughs> I was born to look funky. <laughs> All right, First Corinthians chapter four, and um, we were just finishing up this little um, foray into chapter nine through um, fourteen. Um, let's see, actually 9 through 11 was where we primarily went, so we'll read that real quick. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last as it were appointed to death, for we were made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels and to men, we are fools for Christ's sake. But ye are wise, we are weak, but ye are strong, ye are honorable, but we are despised even under this present hour. We both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. Um, let's see, and let's go ahead to 12. In labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we endure. Let's keep going. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. <clears throat> um, so we'll, we'll just stop right there. <clears throat> and uh, I think I'll just start with a little comment out of verse 9 where he says, For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death. And... Then he begins to describe um, what he terms death, okay? And that's important uh, because he says, as it were, appointed to death, for we are, so I want you to see the See the bridge there that he's making between the first half of verse 9 and the second half of verse 9. <clears throat> and that bridge is the words for, which is a continuation for, we are. <clears throat> and in this case, is giving the example of what death is or the definition the definition of what death is in these scriptures, in this, in this portion of scripture. So let me read it again. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are, and he begins to describe things that if, if we were... Um, if we were your average person and somebody said appointed to death, they would think maybe somebody on death row. <clears throat> because their idea of death is strictly to be dead, physically. Okay? But when he says death, appointed to death for, he begins to describe exactly what he means by that. <clears throat> and what's important to note is, and, and I made this distinction before, and I'll um, make it again. Let's see, make sure I'm not going to. A 
a distinction between the cross where we died, where we were crucified with Christ, the cross, and I'm just going to go ahead and draw a cross again over here being different than this one in its action and activity. And we're going to call it Christ Crucified. And if I'm skinny enough, I can stand right in the middle and the people there can see the cross on my right-hand side and Christ crucified on the left-hand side. All right. The scriptures say um, both of these things are true, <clears throat> that, um, that there is a death that we died with Christ that is settled. Uh, usually the term that goes along with that is the finished work of Christ. Um, and that's not just the work done for us, but the work done to us in that at the cross we died. Okay? And that's very, spe very specific that we died. But um, most of you here... <coughs> have heard me use the term for years and years and years, all the way back to when I was in Bible school and the Lord first started opening my eyes. And the term that I used most of the time up, up until recently is the lamb nature. The lamb. And that's, it's really the same thing. Christ crucified is really the, the same thing. It's just different terminology. <clears throat> But particularly in Corinthians, Paul is using Christ crucified a lot. And he wants us to see the difference between just the death, as it were, of the old man or the old nature, whatever terminology you want to use that was settled and done, as opposed to the nature of God in the Lamb or the nature of God as best defined by Christ crucified. That when you look at the cross, it just depends on which look that you look, as it were. If you look at the cross in relationship to the old nature, you're dead and done. If, but if you look at the cross in relation to God's nature, the nature of the Lamb or the nature of Christ crucified, that is... That, what he did at the cross was there a manifestation of the true nature of God. The clearest picture that you could get of the nature of God. God is love, you know. Um, and there you see, by this perceive we the love of God. And you see him dying for others that don't deserve it. But he does it not magnanimously. He does it because that's who he is. Love. God is love. <clears throat> is that sort of, sort of clear that that's, that's, re that's referring to Christ crucified? <clears throat> and that's Christ crucified is what we've been discussing this whole time. <clears throat> but I just thought it might be good to sort of take a little closer look so that this can help you because it can be confusing, you know, every, you know, us and everybody that we're pretty much affiliated with talk about the cross all the time, but what aspect of the cross? That's, that's important. And, um, and right now, and there are many, many, many aspects, but right now I just want to point out the, the cross as a finished work where you and I died Period. And now, if Christ did in our life, then we're already dead, twice dead. But if, but if Christ is our life, 
because we died, the old man died, or the old nature died, because that happened, and the only life we have now is Christ, then the life we have now is Christ crucified. Meaning a self, here's what we mean by that, a selfless, self-giving one is our life. Okay. And... Uh, And so <clears throat> I'm saying all that to, to point out <clears throat> in these scriptures the clarity of what Paul is pointing out, in, particularly in verse 9. For I think that God hath set forth us the apostles last, as it were, appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle. And he begins to describe the death here that he's talking about in relationship to Christ crucified. Because if he was just talking about the cross, as it were, I mean, I'm going to say it like this. For him, there was all this because this was also a picture of his self-giving nature. But for us, there's no spectacle. We just died. We are God. The Holy Spirit begins to reveal to us our death with Christ. And you're, you're not made a spectacle there. He is. You're just in him who went through all of that. You see what I'm saying? <clears throat> um, however, and he was made a spectacle, hanging up on that cross and mocked and, you know, tormented and tortured and all the things that were done to him. <clears throat> but you see, he did that out of love. He did that out of selflessness. Okay? All right. That same nature that went to the cross and did that is now in us and is now living by Christ. We live by the wisdom of God that was before the ages. And that wisdom of God looks absolutely foolish, first of all, about God, that God would, would send his own son and let people kill him. That that son would allow himself to be taken into the hands of men, to be scourged and mocked and beaten and put in the same category as criminals. And to just make sure it happened, he had a thief on the right and a thief on the left so that anybody that walked by would go, well, thief, 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 or whatever. You know, <clears throat> okay, that, Jesus bore that. But he didn't just bear it, he bore it for us. He, he went into that death to bring us to glory, all right, bringing many sons to glory. All right, so, but now Paul and, and, and this whole book, <clears throat> he has been describing Christ crucified and he's been describing the wisdom of God that is absolutely foolish to everybody that, that uh, you would go this way, that, that you, you would allow your the selflessness instead of to bring you honor and make everybody think you're a wonderful person, you would be so selfless as to be, in the case of Jesus, saving the world and yet looking like, you know, nothing. <clears throat> wisdom of God. The wisdom of man, become famous, become great, become powerful, use your power for others, but of course, in reality, you, you bask in the glory and, the, you know, all of the things that go along with that. <clears throat> You're siphoning off all at all times something that bolsters your ego, you know. <clears throat> and um, so, <clears throat> so what Paul has, is describing here <clears throat> is that he has been telling the Corinthians, first chapter about Christ and the foolishness of the wisdom of God in relationship to him, and then talking about the Philippians, I mean the, the Corinthians, and then <clears throat> comparing the wisdom in the second chapter and in the third chapter, talking about how 
People don't even realize it because they're motivated by self. They're doing things against someone else or for self that will end up hurting or offending or putting someone else down and not realizing that they're tearing down God's temple. They're a Babylonian in spirit and in nature <clears throat> and trying to show that. And then finally in the fourth chapter, he just comes out and he starts saying, look, the people that you respect as leaders, me and Timothy and Titus and you know, Epaphroditus and all of us, this is how we live. We have been appointed to this wisdom. This is our way. This isn't our doctrine. I mean, it is, but you understand what I'm saying. It's not only our doctrine. It is our way. We are last appointed to death. And then he starts describing the death. And that's where you begin to see that it's not a past, complete, finished work. There's no more dying. You're dead. You ever heard me say that before? You're dead. There's no more dying. Okay. Well, I think, you know, of course, I've got so much to learn, but I think at least maybe I knew a little bit about that then, that I was talking about the cross here because I've always preached the Lamb where there's also this ongoing dying, but it's not your dying. You're bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus. You know, you see, you see what we're saying here? <clears throat> All right, and so it's just important to begin to, uh, if nothing else, to go to the scriptures and be able to see the contrast of these, these two things. You know, for example, and, and um, we can just look real quick over in Romans chapter 6, for example. And I do want to say, if anybody has been praying for me and for this class and my time away from this class, <clears throat> I very much appreciate it because I am... Um, I'm in fear and trembling in a good way over these things. Um, Romans 6 is a good, good place to go. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead live any longer in it? And I like reading this word, this verse like, God forbid, how shall we that are dead live any longer? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's written there. I'm just leaving the in it out. Clearly, this is coming on the, well, let's just say it. Which approach is it, the cross or Christ crucified? The cross, absolutely. It's the cross. It is, <clears throat> it is a finished work that if you're dead, how can it, how is it possible is the actual Greek meaning there. How is it possible, you know? And so it would be a little bit uh, like, um, going to a funeral and somebody's in a casket. And, you know, and, the, and yet they're in the casket, you know, doing things that, you know, you just go, how is it if you're dead that you're living any longer in it or living any longer or living? If you're dead, how is it that you're living? Okay. All right. That applies to the cross as the terminology we're using specifically for this. That applies to the fact that if you died, you're dead, and you're not going to have to die anymore when it comes to that area. You're dead. All right. So again, just trying to say it a little bit different. Then where is the area that you might be going through more dying? Well, obviously the terminology be Christ crucified. But do we, do we see through that enough to comprehend that the reason why there's an ongoing death happening 
with Christ crucified is because it's actually just him living and dying through you, bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus, okay? It's really not you. Why is it not you? Because you're dead. <laughs> okay? Now here's where this will this will freak people out. You ready for the freak out? Okay? Okay? Here's the death over here at the cross, and here's the resurrection over here, Christ crucified, living in you. Okay? Can you say amen, there's the freak out? <laughs> you know, I mean, that's where you should be able to go, amen, that is a freak out, not amen, I get it, or I want to get it. But the truth is, the self-giving, and, and I, I'm not going to take the time, but I'm telling you, even right now, a bunch of scriptures are just flooding forth in my mind to show you over and over and over and over and over again that this is, this resurrection life called Christ crucified is the life after death. All right. Now. I think there are several levels why we would have a problem with that, <clears throat> okay? One would be we want to die and get it over with. Can I get an amen on that? It'd be nice just to die and have it over with. Well, guess what? You did die and it's over with. Your problem is maybe you're only half dead. And you're still trying to die to this death where you're dead. Does this make any sense at all? The cross, talking about the cross, you're still trying to die there. And therefore, the thought of, you know, applying the cross to you in a living sort of way, meaning you're still alive, you, the one who should have been dead, is still alive and trying to apply Christ crucified, is an owie that won't heal. You see that? Clearly it would be. Okay. Uh, can you see how someone could misinterpret me or anybody else who's sharing along this line too? Because they would be there in their raw flesh that has not died at the cross. And then you're talking about Christ crucified and they're just going, oh, don't touch me. Ah, ah, I can't do it or I don't want to do it. I mean, even I don't want to do it. I mean, do you think Adam really does want to do this? No, Adam wants to sit on a throne. Um, well, I'm in Romans now, but ye have seated yourself on thrones. That's what Coney Bear, that was his translation of uh, verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 4. You have seated yourself on thrones. And he says, you want to be strong. We, you, you are strong. We are weak. You are exalted in everything because that's what the flesh wants that's what the you know <clears throat> and so there the the application did you hear the word there the application of Christ crucified is one of the worst directions you could take for ministry and popularity that you could ever take. Okay, the application. Okay. Even the cross is way better. Because all you got to do is tell everyone they're dead. You're dead. You're not going to die. You're dead. And then expect nothing. Can I get amen? Think about it. You know, and then you just, everything's on a theological basis. Well, I can live there. I can float around on a cloud of theology, theological statements flowing and coming and going. And yes, yes, you know, and even though, you know, I treat my husband or my wife wrong or my kids or my, jo or my job or this and that, even though I'm, you know, uh, it really doesn't matter because guess what? I'm dead. See? So, 
So I'm not joking when I say Christ crucified is the worst possible turn you could take for your ministry, especially in terms of trying to share it with others who are still just barely grasping the cross. <clears throat> All right. Because when you start dealing with people's motives, it shows them, it's like, you know, and I'm sorry, I'm going to use a bad example here, but it's like, you know, being in a basement, you know, and it's a dark basement, you got a flashlight, and you, but it's not on, you hear a little noise in the closet over there, or in the corner over there, and you shine your flashlight on, and a rat goes, ah, ah, you know, just wants to take off and run. Uh, no, I'm not calling you a rat. <clears throat> Pardon? Is it, did you shoot <laughs> <clears throat> well, actually it was a, oh yeah. <laughs> but, um, but certainly this applies to the flesh that the flesh doesn't want to be exposed. Okay, well, I, I'm going to just tell you straight up and down, God really isn't in the business of exposing flesh. He has no desire to, you know, um, you know, shine a light in the sense that what, what most people think. He wants to shine a light, but it wants to be the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus so that you will be changed from glory to glory into his image but he's not just going, he's not just like, man, I'm going to hunt down the next sinner. I'm going to shine the light on him. Well, you know, we're all in trouble then. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's no hope for anybody. But, but the light of the knowledge of, of the glory of God brings about a change because it brings about a transformation, a metamorphosis from whatever that was. You can expose that all day long and it'll still be what it is, darkness. You, you understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, you, you know, everybody has their own syndrome. Everybody has their own, I'm just going to say it like this, area of darkness and whatever. Shining the light on it doesn't change it one bit. And a lot of people might even, you might even say, let's just say, let's just make it up. Half of the people will go, oh, God. You know, I'm sorry, Lord, I repent, oh, my God, you know. And, um, you know, really be, feel sorry that they got caught. And you understand what I'm saying? I mean, really, really. But how much transformation comes from light that exposes? And I say none. I say none. Now, that, sound, that sounds funny coming from me because people are always telling me, oh, you, were you picking on me in that sermon? Or, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's, it's like they really think I was talking about them. Uh, you know, people say, you, you were reading my mail, my God. It's, or is, has somebody been talking to you? I, I don't know anything, okay? I'm an idiot. I'm just trying to say what God wants me to say. I don't have antennas or feelers or anything. I'm just a tongue. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, you know. But a lot of times, the contrast of Christ crucified to us is a very powerful contrast. And it feels like we're being exposed when in reality he's just trying to show us Christ. Amen. I mean, can you see that? Yeah. I mean, it really, really is. And this is all a matter of motive in relationship to God, you know. Um, but we just, you know, we freeze up or we freak out or we, you know, it's like, you know. And, and he, he genuinely has one desire, and that is his son. That is his son. All right. <clears throat> well, that goes along with the spirit of what we call Christ crucified. God the Father has that spirit. The Holy Spirit has that spirit. They all function because this is God. Okay. And and in that spirit they're not out to get you. They're out to help you to their own loss. 
And a lot of people will argue with you over that. You know, I mean, some of you may remember many, many, many years ago. In fact, even wrote a song about it, but most of you, well, some of you have probably heard it maybe once or twice. But uh, the words on the song says, everything he does, he does by love. Or everything you do, you do with love. Um, I became convinced long ago that regardless of what it seemed like, how God was moving or whatever, I, I became convinced and I believe as much as I know, you know, which ain't much, but <clears throat> that uh, I have held to that, that I believe, regardless of how wild, that he, he is working on my behalf that he loves me and that he wants to bring me in to more of his fullness and more of his light and life and love and everything. <clears throat> and I don't think anybody would convince me any different because I believe I found that out by being sort of introduced to him. You know, I don't claim to be his best buddy or anything to know him that well, but I've been introduced enough to go, oh, you know what, this guy's genuine. This is the way he operates. And so somebody can even show me stuff doctrinally, and we'll even get into some of that eventually here in uh, 1 Corinthians. Um, and there are, there are higher things. There are higher proofs. <clears throat> All right, I don't want to go off on too much of that because then you got the Pharisees rising up going, what the heck are you talking about? There ain't nothing higher than the scriptures, my God. Well, that's not what I'm saying exactly. But, you know, you can never cover all your bases. You're always going to say something that makes it sound like you, oh, so you think you're, you know. Um, a few of you who are in this room might have been in a meeting <clears throat> where I was sharing it was, that, it was in uh, Arkansas many years ago, many, many years ago. It was one of the first Arkansas meetings, maybe the first we went to. <clears throat> How many of you were there? Or, or let's put it this way. There was a guy who's, who stood up after I preached and laid into me. How many of you were there? And remember that? Okay, we got three. <clears throat> um, at that time, Brother Lumen was the only one who shared. And at that conference was the first one wh where he asked me to share. Uh, you know, and there's, it's all his ministers and people from, <clears throat> from uh, his ministry that were there, but he asked me to share, <laughs> and so I got up, and I mean, all I shared was, you know, it's Christ. I mean, that's what I try to say over and over. It's Christ. We're dead. It's not about us, da 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 da, -da. Same old garbage that I always say, and this guy got up. I mean, I didn't even get a chance to walk away from the pulpit and he laid into me and he said so it's all about you huh and just went on and on and the people that were there just went you gotta be kidding me he said just the opposite of everything you're saying well you know who knows maybe it wasn't all his fault maybe in the process of all of that I'd made some statements that sounded that way I know that I mean I don't, sometimes people say stuff later on and they go, well, did you know you said so-and-so? And, and I go, well, you know, either this is, either we're not looking at the context or, you know, I'm an idiot, I don't know, but I know I don't believe that, <laughs> you know what I mean? And would never say that knowingly, but you know, when you're talking about this over here and you're not even, and you say something, and you go, oh, that fits over here. Condemnation. Well, I'm not the only one who faces that. I think we all do. You know what I mean? That's not a, yeah, it's not a, it's not a thing particular to me or something like that. But anyway, um, so let me get back to uh, some of the things we're talking about here. Let's go to um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And remember, we were talking about 1 Corinthians, or, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, uh, that 
we've been appointed unto death. Um, and uh, here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9, uh, we, but we, ha we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Okay. Um, one thing to notice is the similarity between this phrase, the sentence of death, and the, the one used in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. <clears throat> and these are both given at two different times and stages. <clears throat> but it appears that Paul understands from Romans and other places, it appears that he understands, I'm dead, it's settled at the cross, no more old nature. But it also appears that he comprehends that there seems to be this ongoing work of death, something that he tends to put in terms of a sentence of death. And he terms that, as we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in terms of being uh, attacked or doing without or doing, you know, all these things when everyone else is pursuing greatness and highness and recognition and reputation and everything, he's literally embracing the exact opposite in the name of Christ crucified. You know, because he believes that, I, uh, that, that the weakness of God is greater than men, is stronger than men. He believes that. He believes that there truly has to be this death for there to be life and all the preaching and all the ministry and all of the going and all of the stuff doesn't produce an iota of life. It may make converts to your way of thinking, but doesn't produce an iota of life unless there has been some death based on Christ crucified. You know, and I feel a little led to <clears throat> clarify that. <clears throat> and that is... You know, people can treat you bad, and that's not necessarily the death of Christ crucified. You know, why? Well, because you fume and fuss and can't get over it, and you don't like them, and da da da. It's not, it has nothing to do with Christ crucified's death. You know, you call it a death. You might even call it Christ crucified or the cross or, you know, Bambi's baby. I don't know what you call it, but it's not. <laughs> You know, it's not, it has absolutely nothing with the sinless one, the, the, the loving one entering this joyfully for them knowing that the fruit is going to come and I'm holding my place here in this death. Amen. Does, that, does that make any sense? Um, and, and I know what I'm talking about because I've been on the wrong end of that stick. You know, shame, uh, shamefully. I mean, in going through some of the stuff I've gone through, the worst of it for me always is not what I'm going through or what somebody's doing to me, but the fact that I know the way Christ should be coming out of me and I'm not allowing that and I hate that. That kills me. Because I do want Jesus. And because I do, you know, this is so weird. Because I do care for those people. Okay? Now, okay, I'm just making a, a scenario up. Because I do care for them, those people. The Holy Spirit says, well, if you really care, cared, you'd give up your rights and your this and that. And you would lay them down, you know, and come lower and lower and lower, even the death of the cross. Well, I know. I'm, I'm just giving you a scenario, you know. Um, so then, you know, you kind of got to go. I mean, I had to, I have to go. All right, do I care for him at this moment in Christ crucified? And the answer is no, I don't. Not at that moment. It's not Christ crucified coming out of me. It's me trying to be dead or I don't know what. And, and I, I'll say it again. I do not recommend you doing that. 
I don't recommend you doing that. I, I don't. I, I recommend you doing it if it's life, if it's Christ in you. But just because I'm preaching it should be absolutely no motivation to you at all except to say, if it bears witness with your heart, you better go to the author and the finisher of the book because I'm just talking about his book. But I can't do that for you. I can't even do it for me, for God's sake. <laughs> you know? So, um, uh, and, and, and the, you know, just from my side, the worst possible thing that I would want to happen to you is for you to launch your ship out into a hurricane ocean while you're in a little dinghy. May, and maybe while you are a little dingy. Right. <laughs> so, again, please do not attempt this at home. <laughs> we are trained professionals here. <laughs> <laughs> we should put that on YouTube, see what they say. <clears throat> and somebody will say, you said you were a trained professional. I'm an idiot, okay? I'm just joking. I'm a professional idiot. I'm a fool for Christ. I would love to be one. <clears throat> All right. So uh, the first thing I want you to see out of these scriptures is, he says, we had the sentence of death in ourselves and then he says that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead okay most Christians would stop there they would say but we have the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves but in God wouldn't they and what they would do is they would just say oh God help me bless me get me out of these mully grubs help you know all of that because they don't see it, number one, as a sentence of death because they don't comprehend Christ crucified. And, and I'm, am I saying that is true of everybody? No, there's probably more people, you know, that comprehend it than I do. I, I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is for those who read the Bible this way, they simply stop be, and they don't see God who raises the dead because they don't see that they are in a death that God has brought them into because he, we have claimed oneness with Christ, Amen. crucified. And we don't see it as that. So we're trusting in God, all right, but not God who raises the dead. And how can God move on our behalf and in resurrection unless there's a death? Okay. So we have to see that life's situations and things that we're into is more than just ups and downs and good and evil and black and white and everything. It's life and death. It's the cross and the resurrection. And many times we don't. And, and when I say that, I can say that true of us here. Maybe they out there see it more than we do. Many times we don't see that. And besides, isn't we the ones we should be talking to here? <laughs> All right. So, um, so he, he says, but, you know, we had this sentence of death in us so that, so that God would be mean to us for a while. No, so that God would punish us for doing something bad. No, so that we would trust in a God who raises the dead. It's a beautiful thing yeah. if, you, if you comprehend it. And then he goes on to say, verse 10, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver us. In whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Deliver us from what? Uh, we trust he's yet going to deliver. Deliver me from my enemies. Deliver me from, you know, uh, my paycheck. I need more. Deliver me from, that's not, deliver you from death because you've gone down into it by Christ crucified and God raises that kind of death, a selfless death. Hello? Because there's been a lot of people 
a lot of smart people who've died, a lot of spiritual people of different religions and faith who've died that never got raised. But God raises his son, his selfless, self-giving son, and us with him. And he says, and the wonderful wording here is, he's delivered us, he will yet deliver us, and he has delivered, or um, has, was, is, and is to come. All of that in relationship to death and resurrection. Not the cross, not something done and never to look back on, if you understand what I mean, but something ongoing. That's what I want you to see. All right. And then, I know you're well familiar with it, but since we're getting low on this first class time, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4 again. <clears throat> All right. Now, I want you to consider God's definition of power. Again, can anybody remember back, way back to the first chapter? <laughs> can anybody remember back what we called the power of God? No, 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 I'm sorry. Not what we call, called the power of God. What Paul called it, what the Bible calls it, and what God called it in the first chapter. Anybody? Kelly? Okay, foolishness and weakness. Mike? Okay. Christ crucified. Anybody else? <clears throat> okay. Uh, all of that, I'm going to just make a little salad of it. Just a little toss salad. We're just putting it all together here because you're all right. And yet, you're all wrong on other things, but very right on this one. <laughs> all right. Um, the power of God is the, was the, this foolishness of preaching that the, that the Messiah came, or the, a person came, but he was a criminal, and he was rejected by all the religious people, and everybody that should have lifted him up didn't, and they hung him on a cross, and he died, and what's foolish about it is, is you, you idiots think that God has now raised him from the dead, the criminal, and made him the Messiah. This is foolishness. You're saying that bleeding, weak, uh, helpless, hopeless creature hanging there is God? And Paul would say, no, I'm, I'm literally also saying that's the power of God. Right there. That's, that's the power. Not the resurrection. That's the power of God. The resurrection is the result. It's an automatic. Flip the lights, the lights come on. The lights coming on is an automatic of flipping the switch. The cross is the switch, folks. And then we see the results of that. And there, there, the weakness of God is stronger than all men. And there, the foolishness of God is wiser than all men. All right. So you you okay with that definition of power? Because he goes on all the way through, and we had several mentions of different places. Okay. So we're in Second Corinthians four. Let's look at uh, verse uh, seven. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What power have we thought this is talking about? What is that power? Is that some sort of, that the excellency of the power? Have you ever listened to a TV evangelist talk and use the word power? And the Lord will come in power! You know. <laughs> Slaughtered lamb, there it is! You don't hear any of the, that's the power! The power is, you know, Get up here now! Lay hands on you, and the power of God will kill 
you, I'm going to heal you. Because we want the power of God to be exactly what the Corinthians wanted. We want to be exalted and we want to be, you know, strong and we want to be looked upon with a reputation and all of these things. And we, we're afraid of being looked down upon. And we hate uh, being misunderstood. Jesus was totally misunderstood. My God, you don't get any more misunderstood than that. That's the Son of God. He is never sinned, and yet they're dumping all their sin on him. Scapegoat. So the power here, the excellency of the power of God, is going to be well let's let's see if we can figure out what it's going to be let me read this again but we have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellency the power may be of god and not of us we are troubled on every side <laughs> that means we're we're brought to weakness we're brought to foolishness even though even though we're not distressed folks being troubled on every side is no fun Okay? And yet, in, in the right setting, that can be Christ crucified, the power of God. You know? And maybe the only reason why you're not distressed is because you believe in life out of death, because you have that love of God which, it, which has been shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit that says, I will stay in death for others. I, I will not, you know, it's not like I will not protect myself um, uh, as if to say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just not going to do that. I'm not going to protect. It is, I will not protect myself because if I do, they will not receive the life portion of this, the resurrection. But I, I couldn't protect myself, and I'm going to just say it like this, for this is my calling. For you see your calling, brethren, how not many noble, but rather base, you're being base in this situation. How not many wise, you're being foolish, how not many strong, you're being weak to bring forth. The things of God, the life, the resurrection, something for someone else, and you're willing to be misunderstood. And you're willing, I mean, you know, in a, you can look at it like this. Jesus never got a chance to really vindicate himself after the resurrection. He went to just a few people. He didn't, you know, just like sh show up into the stratosphere, you know, above the whole earth or even above Israel and go, Y'all were wrong. I told you so. I was right. Yeah, come on, give me a, you know. <laughs> because that's not a spirit. It wasn't even in resurrection. He sat down on a throne, and he appears as a, la a slaughtered lamb. Okay. All right, so let me, let's see here. Uh, verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal body. Okay, so this is not, be this is not bearing about the truth of the cross around in his doctrine or his theology or his head. I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. He's bearing this in his body. I mean, I want you to see the difference between the cross and Christ crucified. I mean, there's a big difference, you know. And I've heard people, is that a comment or are you telling me i got five minutes? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Uh, verse 11, for we who live are always... Delivered unto death. Okay, my God, folks, if you just read that the way it is, 
All right. So I want to tell you something. <laughs> if in resurrection, <clears throat> if the resurrection life or the new life, the new life is Christ crucified, then in a very real sense, there are no two groups of people. There are no dying, Christ crucified, death people, and blessing, victorious, glory, life people. Because if you actually, if you actually lay down your life that they might have life, what life do you think they're going to get? This, this same life that you did, the same life that we did looking at Jesus. See? Does that make sense? I mean, it's an ongoing thing. Now, yes, there is a period in which you die for others, or you, you understand what we're talking about. You allow Christ crucified through you. But the end result is, folks, when it's, you know, the, the goal is that Christ crucified fill the body, okay? So that we all be selfless. So that we all be thinking of others instead of ourselves first. Does that make sense? All right. So verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. But isn't it interesting that the life in you is going to be eventually being death in you? I know some of you are thinking, Randy, you're an idiot. You can't say that. That's crazy. As, as Abigail used to say to me, that's crazy talk. <laughs> that's crazy talk. <clears throat> well, it's, it may be crazy talk, and I may be, you know, crazy as a loon. But the truth is, is that God doesn't just want his son in us. He wants his son in his nature called Christ crucified in every member so that, you know, if, for example, I'm just going to use this, you know, wild crazy thing of, of heaven. So if you think that heaven's going to be, you know, like segregated, there's going to be the dying people and the living people. Well, you're just wrong. You know, and if you think down on this earth, there's going to be just the dying people and the living people, you're just wrong. And the other thing that I see in this, and I know to, I know to be true just because the Lord has shown me, because the Lord has had to rebuke me so many times to bring me to a place where I can see with his eyes. And the example of that is book of Revelation when it shows the lamb and when it shows the beast, they, the lamb has horns and the beast has horns, and I'm not going to get into everything on it, but the, the beast has crowns all over his horns and his head, and the lamb has eyes. And if it's going to be the lamb, you know, if I, I'm talking about me, if I want it to be the lamb, I'm going to have to quit seeing things through my eyes because the, I will literally be thinking I'm dying for somebody while they might be dying even for me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I need to have those eyes and there's a bunch of them. You know, instead of the ones that are just where I'm going, you know, so I can, you know, What's coming? I don't know, you know. I don't have a clue. What's going on behind you? I don't know. I don't get it, you know. But the lamb does. Because his eyes, all of them, pointed out to others. Okay? And so, how much time? Probably none, right? 30 seconds. What, can, what are you going to say? So... The greatest thing the Lord has ever shown me is, oh, I'm sorry, time's up. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop and we'll come back later on.